Jesus had sent the disciples onto the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and he had gone up to the mountain to pray. As soon as the evening came, the boat was already quite a distance from the shore, and the wind and the waves were already being buffeting it around. The disciples had begun at sunset their battle with the wind and the waves. Jesus didn't go out to them until the fourth watch. That's between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the morning. So for nine hours they've been wrestling with the wind and the water and the dark and the cold. They had to wait all night before Jesus came to help. We don't like to wait, do we? Don't like to wait around in doctor's offices. We don't like to wait for service at a restaurant. We don't even like to wait at a red light. We are a rapid driving, fast food eating, quick fix people. Matthew's Gospel also has that urgency in it. Three times in this one little section he uses the word immediately. Immediately Jesus told the disciples to get in the boat. And when they ran in when they were afraid and they cried out. Immediately he said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And when Peter was sinking, immediately he reached out his hand and caught him. In a gospel with so much immediacy, the disciples <coughs> still had to wait for nine hours. The first hearers of the gospel, the ancient Christians, who were suffering in persecution would take comfort in this waiting of the disciples. It provided them with hope <coughs> that while the circumstances that they were enduring right then were difficult, in time they would be able to persevere and peace would be restored. John Otenberg, on whose writing this whole sermon series has been based, reminds us that waiting is not just something we do until we get what we want. It's also a process of becoming what God wants us to be. The inability to control our impulses and the refusal to live in a waiting and trustful way lies close to the heart of human fallenness. And it's been that way ever since Adam and Eve took the first bite of forbidden fruit. Learning to wait is part of becoming emotionally mature. Waiting in the Lord is not simply passive, like sitting around waiting for the light to change. It's not a, it's not a time that we can duck responsibility or ignore reality or fall, fail to take appropriate action. For example, if you are swamped by credit card debt, you can't just simply say, well, God will provide and then wait for Visa or MasterCard to forgive your debt. You've got to get back to the biblical principles of stewardship and cultivate some good financial habits like budgeting and putting off spending until you have the money to pay. Waiting on the Lord is a confident disciplined, hopeful, expected, clinging to God. Waiting on the Lord is a continuous daily trust and obedience, even when the life of circumstances in our life are not where we want them to be. One of the Hebrew words used in these passages for waiting is kavwa. It means to bind together to look patiently, to hope expectantly. And it describes a binding or entwining of activity and inactivity, of doing the right thing, avoid doing the wrong thing, even while life gives you its own thing. It's actively hanging on to hope in the midst of struggle and suffering. We don't even like to wait for the light to change or our dinner to cook. But in life, there's other things that are much harder to wait for. Consider the single man or woman who so much desires a loving relationship and marriage 
and is losing hope while waiting in desperate loneliness. Think of a couple, a childless couple, whose heart aches to start a family, and yet it's not yet time, and they, maybe they even suffer miscarriage or adoption setbacks. Put yourself in the mind of a deeply depressed person who's just waiting to wake up and want to live that day. Aung San Suu Kyi, who has been compared to Nelson Mandela for her fight for democracy in Myanmar, formerly known as Burma, has spent 15 years of the last 21 as a political prisoner in under home arrest until her final release in November 2010. When Anne Curry asked her on Friday in an interview what <coughs> sustained her all those years, Suchi said with a smile, I just don't know how to give up. Her decades of quiet, non-violent work towards democracy has been worth the wait, and she has been elected to the lower house of parliament, and this week has met with President Obama so that she continues to work for democracy, full democracy for her country. Isaiah, writing to the Jews who had been exiled to Babylon after the fall of the first temple in Jerusalem in the sixth century before Christ. He said, but those who wait in the Lord will renew their strength. They will rise up on wings like eagles and they will run and not be weary and they will walk and not faint. Isaiah's poetry invites people to uh, wait on the Lord, to pray, to read scripture, to meditate on God's actions in history, to turn back to God, to come back into God's community, to confess the things that are separating you from God, to serve God in love. Isaiah calls listeners to participate in God's process, in God's ways, in order to experience transformation. While the ancient Israelites waited in Babylon, they didn't give up. They bought fields and planted and har planted seeds and harvested crops. And at the same time, they prayed to God prayers like in Psalm 130, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits in his word. I put my hope. And yet they still married and built houses and had children. This binding together of tough circumstances and trust in the Lord and actively taking steps towards a kingdom vision creates a powerful core that gives us hope and transformation. Here in our congregation, we've spent the last month thinking about change and hope and God's vision for us. And we've talked about getting out of the boat like Peter, and being with Jesus in those unbounded spaces beyond our self-limitations, to participate in that power that redefines what is possible. And we've talked about using our spiritual gifts to answer God's call and growing as a result versus playing it safe and staying in the boat and risking stagnation and an unfulfilled life. And we've spoken about the tough psychological and physiological elements of fear and developing habits of praying or singing hymns or memorizing scripture so that we can fill our hearts instead with the life-giving spirit. And always, through it all, we've been holding on to that one promise that if we cry out to the Lord, save me, Jesus will be there and his presence will change everything. So maybe now, maybe now you're willing to step out and try something new in your personal life or in our congregational life together. Some of you are going to make that decision and everything is going to fall into place. 
your skills and our needs are just going to mesh and everything will be wonderful. It's going to feel like you're soaring above the mountains. Be grateful for that. Do all you can to stay in the stream of the holy power. Others aren't going to have that experience. They're going to step out into something new and it's going to be a little tougher and they're not going to feel like they're soaring, but maybe they'll feel like they're running. Running and not getting tired. So there'll be some frustrations, but there'll also be the joy that comes from feeling God's presence and pleasure in your obedience. Persistence and determination will keep you working steadily, helping you serve, and you don't need to compare yourself against those people who are soaring because your time will come too. Just keep on running. But for many of us, we're only going to be able to walk. The circumstances in our life is going to be so tough or the new challenge so big that it's going to be enough to just keep putting one foot in front of another. And that's good too. There are many more walkers in this world than racers and soaring eagles. But walking makes a difference. It's enough that you hang in there and that you keep on walking. And maybe the staircase like the one on the front of today's bulletin will look insurmountable to you. But climb anyway, one step at a time in obedience to God. Too often, we are double espresso followers of a decaf sovereign striving to force outcomes to our satisfaction, and we become discouraged when we're not soaring. Henry Newman saw this balance between this patient <coughs> trust and waiting and in the work of trapeze artists. He said, as a trapeze flyer swings out over the crowd, the moment comes when he lets go of the trapeze and arcs out into the air. And for a moment, is suspended in nothingness. It's not able to go back to catch the bar that he released, and he can't accelerate the catching process. He must wait in absolute trust. And if he flails about in 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 anxiety, he can't be caught at all. The catcher will catch him if he remains still and ready. Active waiting. Every time that you make the right decision and win over sin, every time you share your faith story with another or teach a child about Jesus, every time that you visit a hospital or send a card, Every time you give a portion of your resources for God's work in the world, every time you give water to someone who's thirsty or food to someone who's hungry, every time you wait on the Lord, the world changes just a little bit and becomes more like the kingdom of God. So whether we soar or run or walk, it's time to get out of the boat. It's time to walk on water. Amen. Amen.